everyone so today we've got Jody Mayberry with us and I'm super excited because he comes slightly from left field so from Park Ranger to podcast host and um, uh, a builder of profiles for for executives so Jody excellent to have you on board how are you doing today I'm doing great I'm so happy to be here with you I you you talk about some of the things I like the most and and you know you my story is even a little goofier. I, I guess it went from left field or right field to left field and then back out because before being a park ranger, I was a financial analyst at a commercial bank. So it's just gone in some funny turns. So why don't we go into a bit of your background? So uh, obviously you weren't born a park ranger. Let's talk a bit about where on, on earth you are, number one, and then let's go into a quick uh, deep dive into to who is Jody Mayberry? Well, I, I currently live in Washington State, not too far from Olympic National Park, but I am from Illinois. And that matters because when I graduated from college in Illinois, I took a, a trip out into the Western United States and just loved it. Three months living out of a tent, exploring and I got out here and I said, I don't know why I shouldn't live here. So I went back home to Illinois, packed everything I owned into my car. And I came out here to Washington State with like $700 in my pocket. And that was it. It's worked out well. I ended up being a, a financial analyst at a commercial bank. But realized, gosh, that's that's not for me. I thought it was. I wore a shirt and tie to work every day. Worked in spreadsheets with numbers, which I still enjoy, but I decided to become a park ranger. I went back to school at night and got enough natural science credits and became a park ranger. Now, now that that's a great piece of the story that I'm just kind of going to glance over to get to the podcaster piece, and we can always back up if you'd like. But after eight years of being a park ranger, I left that. I went back to school to get an MBA. I did marketing for a luxury home builder. And then when I finished that bout of schooling, I went on and launched my own business. But I felt like, gosh, I kind of miss parks. I still love parks as much as I did the day I became a park ranger. And I came up with the idea, thanks to Jared Easley, who hosted Starve the Doubts, a, a podcast, I came up with the idea of hosting a show for park rangers called the Park Leader Show. I started that in 2014. It's still going, but it was that show that with the idea of having conversations with park rangers for other park rangers that got me into podcasting. So now we're almost 10 years later. And and it's actually been 10 years since I recorded the first episodes, but like a knucklehead, I, I held on to them for months because I didn't think they were good. So I recorded in 2013. I didn't launch until 2014. And now 10 years later, I've done all podcasts combined, like almost 2000 episodes now. And it just, it, it's been quite an interesting journey. And so much that I learned of, from being a park ranger ended up applying to podcasting, ended up applying to the work that I do for former executives. It's it's really interesting. You don't you often don't realize when you're living it how what you're doing now will is laying a foundation for what comes next. And that certainly happened for me. Well, I, th I think uh, to your point and I've said this to quite a few of my students as well, I asked them, what work have you done? What, uh, you know, have you picked berries? Have you worked at a, a cash and carry, etc.? And some of them are a bit shy to say, yes, well, they've gone and literally picked berries. And uh, one of my favorites is um, a professional banana peeler. And now that is a, 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 a staple in our class. We get lots of joy out of, 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 of using these examples. But there's no experience which doesn't help you in some other field. And I've definitely found that. So no matter what you do, you just got to do it. And only perhaps later on in your life will you see, wait a minute, 
that experience with uh, peeling bananas uh, actually uh, taught me perseverance, taught me, uh, you know, that, that uh, every skill has, has some value. Well, and, and and what you just did is, is is just part of the key of it to look at what you've done in the past and say, okay, now that I'm here, what came directly from that experience? It, interesting in that field, my, my wife is a school teacher and I see this with school teachers when I hear them talk, they, they don't often think that their experience translates into other things. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, look at what you do. You, there is so much a school teacher does that translates. And I hear the same, uh, I have police officer friends. And, and when I was a park ranger, I was a law enforcement ranger. Well, it, it is, there is a lot that translates into the next thing. If you do the exercise that you just mentioned and say, okay, what did I learn? And what did that teach me? I think it, it, most people will end up surprised how much came from a job that maybe, and I know this isn't teacher or police officer, it could be banana peeler that you think, okay, I just did this job for the summer. And then you realize what, what you, what you learned from it, what you got out of it, the impact it still has on you today. And sometimes that's only years later. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, quickly touch on, on uh, um, being a park ranger. Now, I'm from South Africa, so we have uh, lots of wild beasts. Um, being a park ranger, I think you've got, what you've got to look out for is falling branches and perhaps uh, some soggy patches in the road. You don't really have that much in the way of animals, do you? Well, so there's a, there's a couple things to say about it. Being a park ranger in the United States is not quite like South <laughs> Africa because... I know in in South Africa, I've, I've spoke at the World Ranger Congress. I've met rangers from all over the world. And it is what what rangers do in Africa is so unique because not only do you have the beast, there are a lot of rangers in South Africa and other parts of Africa that are killed by poachers. And that's not something the rest of the world has to deal with. But in the United States... People often ask about animal stories. They want these crazy, wild animal stories. But the truth is, animals, more or less, are fairly predictable because animals do what animals do. It's the people where you get the crazy stories. So as a law enforcement ranger, I have a lot of crazy stories dealing with people. The only crazy animal story really that I have is about a squirrel. So, that <laughs> I mean, that's not that crazy. Yeah. Well, I, I live in Norway now, and I think we've got to deal with bears coming over from Russia and uh, a couple of um, reindeers and these enormous elks or moose, as you as you call them in, in the state. So totally different uh, sort of environment here. So I, I want to talk about um, storytelling and and the importance of, importance of storytelling. And I'm sure over campfires you've honed your 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 art and over two thousand uh, episodes of, of of talking to rangers and, and other folks, you've honed your your storytelling abilities. Um, and this is a podcast that's really focusing on digital marketing and branding. And um, I want to talk to you about your experience in storytelling and what impact this had on your on your career and how you use storytelling with your with your clients how do you pull out these fascinating stories that are latent within them well that so there's a there's a couple layers here because first it, it ties to what we are talking about something you learn in one job comes back to benefit you later so i was a financial analyst although i've loved to to tell stories and sit around and have fun. I didn't really understand storytelling, but now, even though as a law enforcement ranger, I had to give my first campfire talk because every ranger had to do so many campfire talks. Well, I didn't know what to do. I'd seen some before I'd never given one, but there was a park ranger, Mac Mickelson, who was just great at them. And he he was like the poster boy for being a park ranger. He was six foot four, great shape, looked so good in a uniform, just a big, handsome guy who told great stories. 
So I went to one of his campfire programs and he did one of, called the mini hats of a ranger and he would put a hat on and then he <laughs> would tell what a ranger does while wearing that hat. I didn't know what to do. I had been a financial analyst. I hadn't been a ranger that long. I didn't have good park ranger stories yet. Or hats. So I thought, what's that? Or hats. Or hats. That's yeah. right. But what? Yeah. So I thought I would just copy <laughs> Mac and I, but I couldn't just copy the hat piece so i came up with one called the mini pants of a ranger and I, I would get out a pair of pants and then talk about what a park ranger does while wearing those pants it was a flop i i hate to admit it but halfway through like a 10 year old boy raised his hand and i and i thought oh good a question that this will help my what i'm doing and the little boy said can i go now and I thought, oh my goodness. And it was so, it was such a bad experience for me and the people who were at the campfire program. I said, I have to figure out what these other rangers are doing to make them such good, compelling storytellers. I thought I knew how to tell a story, but now it's different when you've got an audience and you have to captivate them and hold their attention. So I set out to figure out what is going on? What am I missing? And that's when I discovered interpretation, which there that is what park rangers do, but you'll find it in museums. You'll find it in zoos. Even a good tour bus driver understands how to do good interpretation. And there, there is, the first book ever written about the principles of interpretation is Interpreting Our Heritage by, oh, I, for, I forgot his name. But we'll just move on rather than me try to figure it out. But that book and then talking to other rangers, I I learned how to tell, not just tell stories, but do interpretation, which is a little different than telling stories. So now when it comes to podcast, so I found there are three principles to interpretation that I've brought into podcasting. And that's tell a, tell a story, tell why that story matters to the people in front of you not why it matters to you, why it matters to them, the action that you want them to take. So story, why it matters, action. And I thought, gosh, we're almost at a word there. <laughs> so I added a P, which is for business storytelling purposes, which is the payoff. So, so now you've got swap, story, why it matters, action, and payoff. So that spell that spells swap because I also when you're interpreting, you're also swapping your enthusiasm to the other person so they will go and take action. And I use that on on stage. I use it for podcast episodes. It it has really it has really helped. And and then the other way that it's helped is to realize if you have points to get across, they they stick so much better with a story. So when I work with people, so let's say you had a great career at Disney, 30 years at Disney, and now you're out on your own, that to realize that, okay, you here are the lessons you have, but now we have to find the stories to go with it. Or if you have a story, let's find the lessons to go with it. Because it, it's almost, I don't know if you remember, and then if you would have ever seen it. In the United States, many years ago, there was a commercial for Reese's peanut butter cups. They're just one guy walking, eating peanut butter, one guy walking, eating chocolate, and they bumped into each other. And <laughs> the guy said, you got your chocolate, my peanut butter. So that's the myth that that's how the Reese's peanut butter cup was born. It's like that with stories and, and the lessons or points you want to get across. You know, you got your chocolate, my peanut butter, because together they just work so much better. And, and I think it was Jim Rohn who said, and if it wasn't him, I'm giving him credit that you shouldn't you shouldn't tell a story without a lesson and you shouldn't tell a lesson without a story. And and that's I found that to be true. So we will go when if your career is done and you're ready to move on and do your own thing, we'll go through your career and find stories because that that's what matters. And if you've worked for 30 years. There are so many stories. It's just finding the relevant ones that will connect in the in the right way. So to back it up to what you originally said, my grandfather was a storyteller. And so I always knew you could get people to pay attention and gather around if you're telling a story. But I don't think I truly understood the right way to do it 
until I learned interpretation. And that only came because a 10 year old boy was bold enough to let me know he was really bored with my interpretive campfire talk. Well, you were lucky you had uh, some early feedback. I think um, one of the issues with doing public presentations is it's terrifying for most people. And yeah. a lot of folks look at great comedians, great speakers and think, wow, these guys are so natural. They have a natural gift and they were probably born with this. But I'm sure most of these guys have failed horrifically and have been sweating so badly that they wanted to just sink into the floor and have themselves swallowed up. I've, I've had that. Uh, and luckily, I've had enough experience and enough failures to, to realize that uh, you need to be prepared. You need to understand your audience. And that lesson in terms of not trying to put across too many points is equally essential. Well, here, so here's one thing I'm, I'm interested in. You, you mentioned the comedians and other people on stage that they've had a lot of failures. My, my, I talked about mine where the boy raised his hand that I feel like a lot of people when you get, cause that's embarrassing that when you get embarrassed and realize how bad you flopped, there's a decision to make. I'm either going to get better or I'm never going to do that again. So when you've had those failures, what made you say, I'm going to get better instead of I'm never going to do that again? Well, I, I can give an example. Uh, I play classical guitar and I joined up a, to a classical guitar competition. And I thought, oh, I'm pretty good. I was listening to myself play and yeah, I can do this. And I invited all my friends, you know, potential girlfriends in that as well to the audience. And it was the most horrific thing in my entire life. The microphones were set up too beautifully. I'd only had trash microphones before, so everything was soft and sounded lovely. This every little fingernail, every every breath I took sounded like a, a, wild, a wildebeest um, breathing into the into the microphone. And I gave up immediately after that. So you've got to also know when to give up. However, <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. that's in terms of knowing when to quit. But when it comes to speaking, and I, I do this quite a lot with my students now, is practice and having a story arc. And we do Petra Kutcher presentations, so it's 20 seconds, 20 slides, and it's a very set format. So if you can, and a lot of, a lot of them do terribly because they, they don't practice. And if you're going to tell a story, you can't make it up. Uh, as as you go, and you can't make it up when you're going to present. So having, repeating that story, practicing it, and knowing what you're talking about, and I think that experience is probably the key thing. The best speakers are those who've got a bit of experience, and they come across knowing what they're talking about. They come across passionately about what they're talking about. And I, I was listening to a, a, another podcast the other day, very smart guy, very knowledgeable, but he just, it sounded like, unlike you who's done 2,000 podcasts and still have some energy, he was just reciting the old points and just talking about, yes, the American this and that. So he's very good and he knew exactly what he's talking about, but he was just so dull and boring that I stopped watching. And he probably was the smartest guy that had on that show for a while, but he was not engaging he did know his topic, but he didn't engage us. He didn't say, this is a very exciting topic. Let me share some of my feelings and some of my expertise around this. And what I try and do when I, when I talk is, as you said, you want to um, put across uh, your, your excitement about the topic. If you're not excited about the topic, if you're being forced to do it, then it's, gonna, it's going to be very obvious when you, when you present. Yeah, I and I think that's that's part of the key. If you don't feel enthusiasm, neither are the people that are are listening. So yeah, that's it's it's true that and that that is such a a good way to look at it. That gosh, you've because you, you you also have to remember. All right, so you mentioned the stories that you can't make it up on the spot. That's I have a inventory of stories i found people really connect to the park ranger stories so i have maybe 200 
park ranger stories. Some of them maybe are a sentence because I've never had to come back to them. And others, I know the whole thing. Like I, I mentioned the squirrel. I could tell <laughs> the squirrel story just off the top of my head. And there are so many others because I've practiced them. I've told them. And, and that's part of it that you – you have to get out there and practice. And when yeah. I started speaking, I would speak any, any platform you would put me on. I would go, I've given presentations to two people because that's all that was there. But that is great practice because you get immediate feedback when it's two people. And when you get those smaller audiences, it is such a good way to pr good way and a good time to practice those stories that you've pulled aside. And I think if you just have 10 stories that you know really well, then you've got a story for just about any situation or any example that you want to get across. Absolutely. I think it is a strategy. I think all of these guys are really good at, at speaking have their set talking points. If we look at Donald Trump, he's got set talking points. He can, no matter where the conversation goes, he knows he can bring in those three things that he knows really well and talk and, and talk about those. So having that uh, vocabulary of stories in the background that you've practiced and you've honed over time is important. But for those who are starting out, you've got to try and figure out what those stories are for you and practice them. You've got to, you've got to just practice. So for me, practice is, is key. Now, I want to talk about building executive brands and how storytelling comes into that. So you said you've worked with a couple of uh, interesting execs and also um, uh, with the police force and so on. Uh, and you've mentioned that some of these guys, 30-year careers, they probably think they haven't got terribly much to talk about. How do you ring out those stories? How do you, And why do they need to tell stories? Why do they need to build their brands? They've got 30 years of experience. Surely that should be enough on their CV. Well, if you look <clears throat> at, at leadership, for example, let's say someone finishes their career and they want to talk about leadership. There are a lot of people out there talking about leadership. And then if just to use one company as an example, there are a lot of former Disney people talking about leadership. There could have been a time where just hanging out your shingle that said former Disney executive was enough to attract all the interest you need. But there are a lot of former Disney executives out there now. So what sets you apart? One is the stories you tell. And the other is your, your expertise or your niche of this is what I teach. And those so the part of it is finding the right stories and if you have a 30 year career sometimes 40 year career you have this this is one way i i kind of describe it is if you look at world war ii it's like this big it's massive so then if you look at world war ii in russia it cuts it down to like this well then there was a book called enemies at the gate well that takes all the war of russia of world war ii in russia and moves it to this well then there's a movie enemy at the gates that took one paragraph of the book and made a movie out of it that's kind of what you need to do because your 30-year career is like all of world war ii and then you just have to keep putting the pressure on it until at the end comes the movie that came from one paragraph of the book because even the book was too much to do a movie about so they chose one paragraph that just it it just got enough interest to say wait a minute that's kind of a unique thing and so the movie is about one sniper in moscow so that's kind of what you have to do after such a long career to say well i can't talk about all my career i can't even talk about half of it i have to just keep narrowing it down until it's defined enough just like there was world war ii and then there's the movie about one sniper that that's kind of what the, this is that you have to understand the lessons you have to understand the stories and then then you go with it and then i'm not just a former disney executive because there's a lot of them i am a former disney executive who talks about this specifically 
And that's how you set yourself apart. And that's why the, the stories matter because people don't often, if, if you go and see someone speak for 90 minutes, you don't usually remember their top three points, but you probably remember one or two stories that they told. Mm. And that's how you make the connection with people. So let's bring it back to park ranging. How has your park ranging experience helped you bring out these stories from these crusty old execs who, now, who need a new lease of life or want to be able to share with the world some of the amazing learnings and experiences that they've, that they've had? Well, I'll give you I'll give you a very narrow example. In in the Western United States, there is a tree called the ponderosa pine, and its pine needles, when they fall from the tree, they're in little bundles of three. And when we would have school groups come, we would have these little competitions where you pick up a little bundle of needles, and then three kids would grab and all pull. And then there's this little, I don't remember what it's called because it always made the kids laugh. I just called it a booger. It's not called a booger, <laughs> but, but there's like this little booger thing that holds it all together. Well, then whoever gets the little booger is the winner. All right. So you get kids involved in that activity. Now, all of a sudden they're interested in a ponderosa pine but if you just tell a kid about a ponderosa pine, they don't care. Yeah. Adults aren't that different. You get them involved, you enter them into a story, you you make it an experience, and now they care. So that that's the sort of thing that I took as a park ranger that now helps because I realize that if it's a podcast episode or if I'm on stage, if I tell a story that gets them involved, all of a sudden they, then the lessons come, the lessons are experienced different because they were just involved in a story. And, and so that it, it has served me really well. And then understanding how that works then allows me to look for the right stories when I'm working with someone and we're, we're saying, okay, well, this is the, what I want to teach on. Even let's just say someone wants to teach on merchandising, right? That doesn't sound all that exciting, but you find the right stories. And now all of a sudden you can, you can teach on merchandising in ways that are memorable and stick with people. Well, I think what I'm going to do is the first person who can figure out what the Ponderosa booger is called in real life, <laughs> I'll buy a coffee in, in Oslo. <clears throat> so that, that will definitely, I'll definitely, uh, re definitely remember that. You, interesting, you talk about the, again, the story, the storytelling side. We've all been bombarded with AI, ChatGPT, Bard, a variety, a variety of others where if you type in, write me a story about a chicken, it will write a story, which is obviously an amalgam of everything that's found on, on the web. That experience or that personal touch in storytelling is going to become much more important because we are going to have a lot more uh, AI-generated content. How do we make sure that our storytelling remains vibrant and useful in an age where lots of stories have already been told. How, why do we even need new stories? Well, I think part of it is, so to make sure it remains vibrant, I'll address that first, is even people that weren't good storytellers mm -hmm. now can just go to chat GPT and say, tell me a story about a chicken. Okay, so you now have a story about a chicken, but if you ask me to tell a story about a chicken, I can come up with probably two right off the top of my head. And the difference is I experienced one and the other chat GPT told me what to say. So even if I'm going to use it and I'm going to perform it or the one that I experienced comes across better, which then connects better. And, and I think that's one of the big, I, I'm not anti chat GPT. It's a very useful assistant to what, what I do. I will use it from time to time. 
I just think you can't rely on it to create your personality and your stories are part of your personality, which takes us to why do we even need new stories? It's going to be more important than ever because I think with chat GPT and some of these others stories are, you're going to start seeing stories take the same type of format because chat P GTP uh, chat GPT does what it does it formats the way it formats. Well, you'll start seeing people talk in that format because they yeah. use a script written for them. They'll write in that format because chat GPT wrote it for them. Everything will start to feel roughly the same until you come along with the story about the chicken that really happened to you. For example, we, we had someone just for no reason that I ever found out release some chickens in one of the parks I worked at. And then we had, we had to catch them. <laughs> we, we probably could have just let them go and the coyotes would have taken care of it, but, but we went out to catch them. So that's more appealing probably than a story that chat GPT comes up with. Yeah. So it, 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 I think something like that is really good for ideas and the better you prompt it, the, the better it does, but it will never replace personal experience. It'll never replace emotional connection. And it, it's a way to enhance, but as things start to sh take the shape of chat GPT and Bard and all the other ones that are going to do what they do, I think the person that can, experience and create and then tell their own stories are there. You're going to stand out even more. Well, something that just came into my mind when you, when you spoke, uh, spoke about chat GPT is uh, there's that story about an elephant was locked in a, in a dark room and they sent in a couple of people in there to say, who'd never seen or heard of an elephant elephant before and said, okay, you need to tell us what an elephant is. And one of them just got hold of the trunk. One just got hold of the tail. One got hold of a leg. And they all had different stories about what the truth, what the truth was. And I think that's similar yeah. to chat GPT. It's taking bits and pieces without really having a, a very good understanding of the whole or being able to see the, the whole picture. So I think, I think we're still safe. Like you said, very useful. <laughs> And uh, I, I use it as well, and I encourage my class to use it as well. So definitely, the, I think that emotional and that lived experience is, is super important. Uh, in terms of storytellers, so you're a storyteller, and some of my favorite storytellers are the likes of Hemingway, and especially that one where he was asked to write, you know, it was the shortest um, story in the world, it was just an advert and it said um, pair of baby shoes for sale never used and you know just little story that is a whole story in, in itself uh, the likes of Tolkien, B. Traven, Ludwig Bemmermans and then in advertising Ogilvy. Are there any good modern storytellers that that you can that you can think of any anyone who now is a new Plato or new Socrates somebody where people would go and listen to this person? Well, I, so I come from central Illinois surrounded by farmland and, and <clears throat> that, that old country feeling sort of story, that's what really connects with me. And, and so may my examples I'm, I'm going to give, I think they're wonderful storytellers. Are, are they Hemingway and Plato? Probably not but they're delightful country style storytellers. Like you would just get sitting on the front porch of the local mercantile or something like that. And the first is Garrison Keeler, who if you're not familiar with him, he had Prairie home companion for decades, wonderful storyteller. And the other is Rick Bragg, who's from the Southern United States. There, so he narrated one of his own books called My Southern Journey, which is the, the book itself. If you read it, you'll enjoy it. It's a collection of articles that he wrote for magazines about living in the, the South. But if you do the audio book that he narrates, you will experience 
a master storyteller. More short form stories because they're articles and not one big long book like Hemingway would have written. But my goodness, the audio version of My Southern Journey by Rick Bragg, I think you'll get a feel for what a good country style storyteller is. It's just fabulous, just phenomenal. His other stuff is good too. Even his longer books are good. But to me, there's something so special about that in the way that it's almost like you just ran into a friend in the parking lot and he's going to spend five minutes telling you something that happened. <laughs> That's what that book feels like to me. And, and he's a, if you want to learn how to tell a story in a short format that gets a point across and entertains and once leave someone wanting to hear more, that's, that's it. My Southern journey by Rick Bragg. Well, I'm definitely going to put a link to that in this podcast. So, and I'll, I'll check that out myself before we go, you, you've brought this upon yourself, but I need to hear the story about the squirrel. Oh no, <laughs> the squirrel. Uh, well, I, I actually don't tell the story any often anymore. I put an episode on on my podcast, the Jody Mayberry yeah. Show, about the squirrel because so okay. many people would ask. But I will tell you, uh, there. So I had a friend who was at the park visiting. So that matters. So you'll understand why he called me on my cell phone. So there's someone in the park sitting there reading a book and a squirrel jumped onto his shoulder. Now this person was my friend. So the, he thought, gosh, that's weird. I've never had a squirrel jump onto me. And the squirrel craw climbed, crawled down his arm and then bit him in the wrist. <laughs> and, and then it wouldn't let go. And he thought if he pulled it off, it would do damage to his arm. And he finally could not take the pain anymore. So he just flung it off and he's just bleeding really bad. So he walks to the ranger station and there's no one there. So he called me on my cell phone and said, I've been bit by a squirrel. I was roughly seven or eight miles away. So I call out on the radio asking if there's any other rangers in that area because I'm far away and a park visitor has been bitten by a squirrel. Well, of course, no one believes that. And they just start <laughs> mocking me on the radio. But one park ranger, the only female park ranger on duty, and probably because she was a female, she actually cared. So she went and to show up to see what happened. So when I got there, she was there had already given tended to the cut, help bandage it up. Well, then I call fish and wildlife to say, Hey, we, we had a park visitor bitten by a squirrel. Is there anything we should be concerned about? Does it have rabies? He said, no, in Washington state, the only thing with rabies is bats. So he doesn't have to worry about rabies, but you may still want to take him to the hospital because he, it could get infected. You don't know what that squirrel's been biting on. Well, while I'm on the phone with the fish and wildlife officer, a squirrel shows up and the guy who got bit started saying, that's him. That's the one that bit me. I can tell by his mangy tail. So I asked the fish and wildlife officer, what do I do? The squirrel's back. And he said, well, you either need to catch it and relocate it because if it bit one person, it'll bite another. Likely what happened is someone took a baby squirrel as a pet and squirrels make terrible pets. And then they let it go in the park and the squirrel didn't really know how to get food for itself. And so it was trying to get food from a person and just hand asked in a very bad way. So he said, you either have to catch it and relocate it or you have to dispatch it, meaning get rid of it. So I'm trying to decide what to do and it starts hopping over to me. And I said, Hey, the squirrel's coming. I got to go. And I slid the phone into my pocket and that's, and I was wearing shorts. It was a, I lived in a area that was hot. So you could wear shorts with your uniform, but this squirrel from about five feet away jumps and it lands on my boot and then it climbs up my leg and into my shorts up my, sh my short, my pant leg. 
<laughs> so I just do this like Elvis gyration move and knock it out of my shorts, but it clawed its way up. So my legs all, all cut, uh, scratched up. And then it ran, there was a telephone pole nearby. So it ran up the telephone pole, but you know, now it's gotten personal. If you're going to do that, it's gotten personal. So the, uh, the guy and the guy who got hit, he's yelling, shoot it, shoot it, which I'm not going <laughs> to shoot the squirrel. The other park ranger, she's got a bucket to try to catch it. And then the guy who got bit, he got out a bagel from his car and he put it under the telephone pole. The squirrel came down to get the bagel. It couldn't carry it up the telephone pole. So it stopped to eat it. And, uh, I took my baton out of my belt and, and, uh, that's, that's where the story ends is <laughs> not good for the squirrel. Um, but we, we were, I found out later that the other Rangers were going to, as a joke, they were going to get a taxidermy <laughs> taxidermied and, and put on display in the park museum just as a joke. But the, the, other park ranger had put it in the freezer to save for oh, fish God. and wildlife. But if uh, you, if you freeze something, it kills rabies because it's a bacteria on the brain. And so when fish and wildlife picked it up, they saw it was frozen and they just threw it away. So you would think the story was over at that point, but the park manager, I was a new enough ranger. I didn't know any better. The park manager said, you have to fill out a use of force report because <laughs> you use and I didn't know any different. So I did. And I sent it in and immediately I got a call from headquarters and say, did you just send in a use of force report for a squirrel? <laughs> and then that story stuck with me forever. And then I was uh, transferred parks about seven hours away and we had a volunteer camp host and I came and introduced myself and she said, I, I've heard of you. I said, Oh really? And she's, she said, yeah, you're the, you're the one that beat the squirrel. And I said, how did you hear that? And she said, from a park ranger in Idaho. So the squirrel just story just never, never left me. People would send me like squirrel toys and squirrel statues. It stuck with me forever. I'm I'm sorry to make you relive that trauma, but on, to your in your defence, I think that uh, squirrel had a taste for blood, so it would have been very dangerous to uh, to, to keep around. Yeah, Jody, that's right. It's been fascinating chatting to you, and uh, it was good to hear a story from you as well as a storyteller. And uh, I will put in a couple of links to some of the things that we've chatted, and for folks who want to learn a bit more about you or maybe get in, in touch with you. I'll drop your details in the podcast description as well. But it's been a very enjoyable chat for me. And hopefully you're about to come to Africa one day and go see some real animals. Yes, I, I'm up <laughs> for it. I've always wanted to. Great. Thank you so much. Mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and share with